Fantasy Football Happy Hour with Matthew Berry, served by Applebee's. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Happy Hour. I'm Connor Rogers alongside Matthew Berry, Jay Croucher. For the last time, our virtual show, guys, we are finally back in our studio tomorrow, guys. I cannot wait. Matthew, did you miss me yesterday, by the way? You know what I did? I, I didn't understand why you weren't there. Like, I just, I asked Jay... And and Jay said, I think you were buying a new house, right? Is that like I think that's what day. happened. It's the only time I'd miss I'd miss this show is for yeah. something that monumental. Yeah. So, but but what I asked Jay, and you can and defend yourself here, like because you probably didn't get a chance to watch yesterday's show. But what I asked Jay, as it's like, like really, when you think about you know sort of the operation there of the Rogers household, it's Kristen's the brains of the operation, without a doubt. So it's like, do you need to be there? Like, I mean, like, I like, couldn't you have done the show and just, Hey, Kristen, send me pictures. Like we all know Kristen's the one signing and doing the, you know, they make both of you sign. That's is the that problem. what it is. Yeah. That's the problem. I tried to wiggle my way out of this. Trust me. I tried to wiggle my way out of every bit of the house process in total. Uh, I just said, you know, let me know what bills we got to contribute yeah. together. And they said, no, I have to be there. They need my sig- my awful handwriting signature. So, and unfortunately it was exactly when we taped. So tough scene. I couldn't make well, it work, Matthew. I apologize. It's good to have you back, Connor. Uh, you, I, po- I apologize in advance for Matthew wearing a hat for the fourth day in a row. Um, I hope I need it. You know what it is? Is this yeah. going to happen in the studio? No, I, I don't. Maybe I'll wear one tomorrow. I what I need to do? I need a haircut, to be honest with you. And it's it's very no. frustrating if I'm be honest with you, because I'm balding. I mean, as you guys know, like, no, you know, no, no. My hairline not. is all in your head. My hairline it's is. I am follically bad. challenged. But what's awful is, is that even though like I'm basically balding, my hair still grows and it just doesn't look good. And it looks like I, you know, and I just, when you get to be my age, Jay and Connor, you'll see this. Like what happens is that it's your hair that you want to grow stops growing, but hair that you don't want continues to grow. And so it's just like, I like, I'm still balding, but like, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a little bushier and it just doesn't look that good. So, um, yeah, you know, I, oh, so yeah, another I'll Adam at home, whatever I am representing. Like I can't like, I, can you see that? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, ah, I remember a little football night in, night in America t-shirt. So I'm representing, you know, the home team yeah. here, but, um, uh, yeah, you. like I'll, I'll get a haircut, I think, uh, tomorrow or um, late, t- maybe this afternoon before tomorrow's uh, big show. Yeah. Okay. Well, in, me and Connor will never go bold. We refuse. Yeah. It's a mindset. All right. So yeah, I agree. Are you today, doing the show from your new house, Connor? No, I don't have internet there. Nothing. Literally, yeah. it's just empty. That's yeah, it. I mean, I don't have it at my house. Doesn't stop me. <laughs> That's very true. I could yeah. end up like you and Blurry, you know, Barry. freeze, modulate, whatever it may be. We're gonna close out our positional overviews today. Ten of the biggest wide receiver questions heading into the season. Of course, we will close out the show as well with the Roto World Player news. We got the latest uh, with the injury to Jameer Gibbs, Tyrone Tracy, unfortunately, and the commanders make a splashy signing that I won't reveal till the end of the show. Yeah. All right, let's jump right into it, guys. The 10 big wide receiver questions heading into 2024. Matthew, everybody's kind of watching the preseason, getting the, uh, the highs off of every quarterback performance that seems to be spectacular. The Vikings are one of the more interesting ones. Sam Darnold looked good. J.J. McCarthy, after a rough start, looked really, really good. Is Justin Jefferson quarterback proof in this scenario? I mean, this is somebody that we've seen absolutely shine with Kirk Cousins, but can that carry over as they have a little bit of a downgrade with the younger quarterback duo? He was good with Nuck Mullins, too. I I think Justin Jefferson, it's insane to say what I'm about to say, but I believe Justin Jefferson is being underdrafted. I like I, I'm at wide receiver four. I, I think he should be going in the top five of drafts. I have, I literally was just on the radio doing a hit before I, I joined here and like, Whoa, we, lucky yeah, guy. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, I'm not the only one, you know, listen, Connor and Jay, you guys are on <laughs> 8 billion different podcasts. God forbid you ever focus radio, on this one. So yeah, I just did a radio hit to promote our show. You know what I mean? Like, uh, but anyway, um, uh, you know, and, and we were talking about the fact that, Jefferson sometimes goes like seventh or eighth overall in some drafts, which is just insane. Like last year, eight healthy games, a 31% target share. And now KJ Osborne isn't there. TJ Hawkinson's going to miss the first half of the season. I think my argument would be that whatever inefficiencies there are at quarterback, that will be made up for in massive, massive target 
uh, share. And oh, by the way, he's insanely talented. He's he's one of the most talented, if not the most talented wide receiver in the NFL. And I don't think that, I, I think whether it is Sam Darnold or J.J. McCarthy, that they will be confident enough as a quarterback to get the ball to Justin Jefferson. I, again, four games without Kirk Cousins last year, he averaged over 22 fantasy points per game for his career. He averages over 98 yards a game. Like, like it's just all the numbers are insane. And he's competing with, like, other than Jordan Addison, he's competing with, like, Jalen Naylor. for tar- Like, what? What are you doing? Like, I, again, like, people, un- and, and obviously it's a different situation, but we were in the same situation last year with Mike Evans where people are like, ah, Baker Mayfield, I don't know. I, I don't want I don't want Mike Evans. He's 30. He's playing with Baker. Like, eh, I'm out on Mike Evans. And then, like, monster season from Mike Evans. And Baker Mayfield was obviously a lot better than anyone expected him to be. But so I, I actually – I'm a believer in – I actually thought J.J. McCarthy looked really good uh, in the preseason game. And I think, Connor, I don't know how you feel about him as a prospect, but I, I, I think that the Vikings would be – would be well suited just to get JJ McCarthy in there as soon as possible. But yes, as it relates to Justin Jefferson, if I, if I'm in a draft where he's the number one wide receiver taken, I'm not like going, what were you doing? When you think about Tyreek Hill's age, when you think about CD lamb's contract situation, like you can make an argument. Jamar chase also had a bad injury last year. Like you can make an argument that Justin Jefferson should be the number one wide receiver. A guy that was the consensus number one last year. Jay, what do you think? I would take Justin Jefferson first overall in fantasy. Um, and I understand that, you know, f- fantasy now in ADP, it's like a relatively efficient market. Um, and most of the edges to be found are somewhat marginal. You know, a guy going should go wide receiver 14 when he's going wide receiver 18 or whatever. But with Jefferson, I just don't understand why he's not considered as wide receiver one when you look at his past three years. His, where, here is where he's ranked in terms of receiving yards per game. Second, first and third and then his rookie year he was sixth uh he is right now he's 10 to 1 to win the receiving title that means he's a, the market thinks he's a nine percent chance i'm telling you there is more than a nine percent chance that justin jefferson has the most receiving yards in the nfl and i just think that some of the ancillary factors like the fact that yeah it's going to be donald or mccarthy and they're a step down from kirk cousins well is the thing is that they're going to be in a throw script i think a lot of the time because they're projected to be you know last in the division a seven win type of team they play in a dome which really helps relative to Jamar Chase. Also, Jefferson is 25 years old. Tyreek Hill's on the other side of 30 and gets hurt at the end of every season. So I just think that you weigh everything up. And even with if you're debating, look, Christian McCaffrey is going to go number one in the bulk of drafts, clearly. But like McCaffrey's getting older and he's dealing with already um, soft tissue strains and an older team and a suspect offensive line. Like I just think that Jefferson has such an insanely high floor and we have a, we have proof of how he did without Kirk Cousins. He was 22 points per game uh, in four full games without Cousins. And there was like some Jaron Hall mixed into that. Like they're going to get better performances at quarterback this year than Jaron Hall and Nick Mullins. I'm with you guys. And, and also he has a great play caller that that has to matter so much here that I think right now things are, I would give Darnold the nod and Darnold is going to start the season. I think they want to be really careful with how they throw McCarthy into the fire as impressive as some of the throws he made um, were in his preseason debut, especially after he got that interception out of his system. He made some really, really nice throws, but I think this system is kind of tailor made for Darnold to get another shot not saying he's going to have that Baker Mayfield season, but I think the quarterback play will be fine. And I think if you're drafting Justin Jefferson, that's all you really need because as you guys alluded to, he's just too damn talented. And a guy that has shown that the last two years is Garrett Wilson, somebody that has had no help at the quarterback position. Quarterback play has not been fine, and he's been good. Now, the number one thing at hand here, I mean, in, Jay, fairness to, in, in fairness to Garrett Wilson, like one of his quarterbacks was – Comeback player of the year last year, Joe Flacco. I mean, uh, at one point, like two years how'd, ago, how'd Flacco play with breakout that game. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just you remember that, Connor. Just remember that. I mean, and then breakout game. And then obviously the Flacco goes to Cleveland. He wins the comeback player of the year last year. A lot of people, Which, um, nobody people saw, that, saw coming. that coming. Not yeah. everyone saw it coming. You, Some you people had a lot of money on other other people, but just you, I don't, you know, you but missed just, this. You talk about quarter, I just, Connor, you mentioned that Garrett Wilson produced with bad quarterbacks, which he did with. Whatever Zach Wilson. One was good. 
Mike White, but Flacco, Decorated last year's Joe comeback Flacco. player of the year. Yeah. You missed this yesterday, Connor, where Matthew brought up Joe Flacco, comeback player of the year, I think for the first time ever. Um, uh, I think I'm going to go all in. On the show? I'm going to go all in on just the Sean Watson, comeback player of the year. Screw it. Let's <laughs> it burn happens. it all down, baby. Let's burn it all down. I don't care uh, anymore. This I, award is completely meaningless. Let's just go with I, this one. I follow a lot of your wagers, Jay. I don't, I don't know if I'll be tailing that <laughs> I just no, want to. I just want to say this. I, I just want to say. I, I don't want to say how much money Jay lost um, on uh, on Demar Hamlin not winning Comeback Player of the Year. But suffice it to say that had Demar Hamlin won Comeback Player of the Year, Jay would have quit this show and been on an island. So yes. I'm just saying to you that you know the fact of the matter that Jay is stuck here with us and he's having to slog through Bet the Edge with Drew Dinsick every day. Like you know, I mean, just like that's just. <laughs> That's, that's the you know, he's, he's having to uh, he's having to work his way out of the debt from uh, I, Joe Flacco becoming uh, comeback player of the year. Yeah, if the guy that had died won comeback player of the year, I'd be wearing hats, <laughs> be wearing a lot more hats, be closing yeah, houses, want. be doing yeah. all the things you guys are doing. Um, but getting back to Garrett Wilson, um, yes, I think I think. Oh yeah, I forgot the, that's the subject. Yeah. That's the topic. <laughs> I think back, Connor, the two years ago, and this is what is my overriding thought with the Jets going to this season is just how exceedingly competent the offense looked with Mike White um, and right. just now when the offense was running on time the connection that White had with Garrett Wilson and like this is Mike White like this isn't even like Jacoby Brissett or something this is Mike White I think just the ability if Rogers can just play 17 games then Garrett Wilson in terms of his ceiling I'm not sure what his actual his ceiling is but I mean he could absolutely be a top five wide receiver do you think, Connor, though, that they're going to throw the ball enough for Garrett Wilson to potentially be a top two, three wide receiver? I think they're going to throw the ball enough to him. That's the key is that everything is just so funneled in this offense to him. Yes, they got Mike Williams. He just got activated off the pup list. He's when you look at the history of wide receivers coming off an ACL like that, I don't think Mike Williams is going to be full throttle until October. And even then. This is Garrett Wilson's offense, right? It's Tyler Conklin. Brees Hall will get his targets. But I just think that the number one thing here, guys, and Matthew, I want to toss this point to you, is that, you know, Garrett Wilson, what's been holding him back in fantasy is the lack of touchdowns. The yeah. fact that he has seven career touchdowns. He has four or fewer in both seasons. The yardage, the targets, the receptions, none of that has been a problem. And it's not going to be a problem with Aaron Rodgers or Tyrod Taylor, who's your better fallback option than what they've had. But I think the most important thing here, Matthew, and why I trust Garrett Wilson a lot in fantasy this year is that the touchdown equity, it almost feels like the floor touchdowns for him is six or seven this year rather than three or four and can easily have a double digit season for the first time in his career. Yeah, nowhere to go but up with it, which the touchdown equity, because here's the thing. This is a guy that got 50 percent of the Jets end zone targets last year. That was the third highest rate in the NFL. They just they weren't connecting. Right. I mean, again, because they're just quarterback play was so awful and just they got in close and they're like all right we're we're gonna double and triple team this guy but now you've got you've got real red zone threats in mike williams in tyler conklin i'm sure there's gonna be like a package for malachi corley um you know Brees hall obviously fully healthy he's a threat so i think that they will design more plays for garrett wilson and here's the other thing i don't have a stat for this but one of the things i think that is missing and I talk about this all the time, but one of the things that I think is missing in fantasy football analysis is that these are people that fan that NF the NFL is played by human beings and human beings have emotions, right? They, you know, they, they have, they have emotions, good emotions, and they have bad emotions. They have petty, they have jealousy, they have, you know, ego. And so I am just telling you that Aaron Rodgers, now in New York, after a year where he had to sit on the sidelines with the Achilles and everything like that, what does Aaron Rodgers, and everyone's just like, he's 40, he just needs to hand off, he just needs to be competent, that kind of stuff. Aaron Rodgers has heard all this talk. No one pays attention to the media like Aaron Rodgers. And so Aaron Rodgers, I think, is going to want to have a very good statistical year. So what happens when he gets the five-yard line? Is he handing off to Brees Hall? No. I think he's checking out of that. He's going to call, he's going to say, hey, Garrett Wilson, you're just going to do a little slant inside, boom. Just cheap touchdown after cheap touchdown. We saw that all the time in Green Bay with him and Devontae Adams. Again, like good plays as well, but I just quick feel game. like. Yeah. Huh? Just quick game stuff. Just quick game stuff, like just turnarounds, like fades as well. Like I just think that Aaron Rodgers is going to want to make Garrett Wilson a thing because that's going to be good for Aaron Rodgers. It's going to be good for the Jets, obviously, but it's also going to be good for Aaron Rodgers. And so, yeah, I mean, the I just – 
I don't know what the odds are, Jay, of, uh, you know, uh, Garrett Wilson only having four touchdowns again for a third straight season, but I'll take whatever those odds are and give me the over. Yep. No, absolutely. I think that it, just by necessity and the fact that if he just stays healthy and the, the just the distance between him and the next best wide receiver on the team, like that's what you want with upside uh, with your wide receivers. It's the same reason why Amon Ross St. Brown is so compelling, just the gap between him and Jameson Williams. So it's going to be Garrett Wilson. And we've seen that his, his ability to produce with no quarterback, uh, you know, approaching competence. And now that Rogers for whatever he looks like off the Achilles, we can be very confident that he's going to be the best quarterback by far that Garrett Wilson has played with in the NFL. And I think you can argue that Tyrod Taylor, if anything were to happen to Rodgers yep. this year, that Tyrod Taylor would also then be the best quarterback that Garrett Wilson's ever it's played true. with, with all due respect to comeback player of the year, Joe Flacco. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, uh, he's my wide receiver eight uh, this year. And I just, I think Garrett Wilson is, Talent, you know, he's got all the things you're looking for, talent, usage, and a very good quarterback. Every few seasons, guys, we get a rookie wide receiver that is drafted over superstar household names just because of maybe the situation and obviously the talent. Marvin Harrison Jr. is falling into that bucket right away here, Matthew. What are the rookie expectations for a guy that I believe is in your top 10 wide receiver rankings right now? Yeah, he's my wide receiver 10. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is that I think the expectations here, and I'll just, I'll give you, you know, my guy, Dwayne McFarlane, fantasylife.com, who, who does all the projections. He's unbelievable. He does a really great job. This is what Dwayne projects. 133 targets, 86 receptions, uh, about uh, 1,079 receiving yards, over six touchdowns as well. Uh, my friend Mike Clay over at uh, ESPN, he does a great job. He projections around the same, 129 targets, 83 receptions, 1,100 receiving yards, six touchdowns. So we're expecting, like, those are two guys who I think do really good job, do a really good job with projections, and they're both projecting a little over 1,000 yards, over 80 receptions, about six touchdowns. I think that's right, but I think there's the chance that he elevates even more. Since 2010... Producer Damien found this stat. Get this. Since 2010, five of the six wide receivers that are drafted inside the top five saw at least 115 targets in their rookie season. So, um, you know, and, and that's certainly obviously what we're projecting or what Dwayne is, is projecting as well, right? Over 130 targets for him as well. You think about who he's competing with for targets. We like Trey McBride quite a bit. You know, I I, I think people are sleeping on Greg Dorch, the human Dorch. Um uh, you know, it, you know, and we had some nice moments from Michael Wilson, but make no mistake, Connor, you can speak to this better than I can. Marvin Harrison, the sense that I get is that Marvin Harrison is to wide receivers what Trevor Lawrence or uh, Andrew Luck were to quarterbacks to what Saquon Barkley was to running backs in terms of like can't miss prospect. This is, you know, as good a ready made for the NFL prospect coming out of college as there has been in the last, you know, handful of years. Absolutely. The two best receivers I've ever evaluated have been Jamar Chase, who his rookie season, 81 catches, 1,455 yards, 13 touchdowns, which is ironically the best of his career so far. Maybe that, that bar is a little too high. And Marvin Harrison Jr. I, I mean, that's how special we're talking about here, Jay, in an offense that we like the quarterback in Kyler Murray. The offensive line is trending in the right direction. And this is a team that doesn't have enough skill talent yet. That is a hurdle for a rookie wide receiver to get over. So if you were creating a tailor-made situation in all of this, Jay, for a rookie to have oh. monster numbers right away at the wide receiver position, similar to what Chase did. And once again, I think that bar is a little too high. Marvin Harrison Jr., it's all there. And I'll Definitely. ask Jay this real quick. Before you answer, Jay, I just want to ask you a quick question too. What's their win total? Because I assume it's got to be pretty low. Again, this is not going to be a good defense either, Jay. Yeah, their win total has been in the six and a half type of range, um, which yeah, I think that, right. look, the issue with them is they have a really difficult schedule. So that's bad in terms of, you know, accumulating wins, but it's get good blown in out. terms of, yeah, producing exactly. volume for wide receivers. So right now, the over six and a half has been back to minus 150. So look, they're probably going to be about a seven win team. And that's fine for Marvin Harrison Jr. And I think that the bull case for MHJ relies a bit on the fact that it went a little bit under the radar because no one, I think, was watching Cardinals games in the second half of last year. But 
And it didn't show up a ton statistically, but just I thought that watching Kyla Murray, I thought in the yeah. back half of last year, I thought that was the, the best that he had looked since the first half of 2021. When people forget, like halfway into 2021, the Cardinals were running away with the one seed and Kyla Murray was the MVP favorite. Like he's the number one pick in the draft. This guy, I think, still has untapped potential. Uh, and I sh shudder to say the words comeback player of the year, but he's 30 to one for comeback player of the year, which is the same price as Russell Wilson, who played the whole season last year and isn't coming back from anything. Um, not that that seemingly matters for this award, but I digress. <laughs> I think there is upside in Kyler, in MHJ. At the same time, though, uh, like he's going as like wide receiver nine at the moment. I would probably rather wait you know, 20 picks and get Cooper Cup or Jalen Waddle. And we're going to talk about Cup a little bit later. So I think I don't think there's a lot of meat on the bone at current ADP, but certainly there's upside for him to produce and, and have that type of, you know, 1,200 yard, seven touchdown type of season. So as Marvin Harrison Jr. starts his career, Jay, Devontae Adams, who turns 32 in December on the back end of his, still looked at as one of the top receivers, of course, in fantasy but coming off a career low six and a half yards per target last year, Jay, it, are you nervous to draft him knowing that this is a team that somehow did not get that much better at quarterback? Yes, they added Gardner Minshew. It's year two of Aiden O'Connell. But you look at what the six teams in front of them did in the draft and the moves made in free agency in the trade market. That has to give you a little bit of an uncomfortable feeling for Devontae Adams, who doesn't appear to be traded anytime soon. No. And look, the good news for Devontae Adams is that last year he had 175 targets and that was second in the NFL. And the year before he had 180 targets. Um, so the Raiders number being at 175 last year um, with an offense that's probably going to resemble somewhat last year, just in terms of uh, whether it's Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew, I think that it's going to be funneled towards Devontae Adams again. So he's going to be a target share monster. That's the good news. The bad news is that he had 175 targets last year and was wide receiver 15. So is he going to be able to um, produce more touchdowns? Is he going to be able to um, just connect on some of the deep balls that Jimmy Garoppolo comically missed um, with him last season? I think there is still upside. He's getting a little bit older. He's going to turn 32 later this year. Uh, so I think with Devante, I think he's relatively high floor just because of the targets, but I wonder about the ceiling just in that offense. I think that's a great call. That's exactly right. The floor, it's he's a floor play as your wide receiver, too. And there's nothing wrong with that as well. Look, he had 10 games last year that Aiden O'Connell started, 35% target share for Devontae Adams. You think about Gardner Minshew last year in Indianapolis, like he was able to support Michael Pittman as a fantasy relevant wide receiver. 10 targets a game, over seven receptions a game for Michael Pittman with Gardner Minshew under center in Indianapolis last year. But to your point, like, uh, just because they couldn't connect on the deep passes, like 6.5 yards per target last year for Devonte Adams. That was fifth lowest among all qualified wide receivers. He averaged under 68 receiving yards a game, which was his lowest since 2017. So it's almost like he became kind of this, he became a dink and dunk volume guy, right? You know, and you don't expect that from Devonte Adams, but again, just the massive volume and his talent, I think, keeps the floor high. But you're right. For There are guys going in that range, the Malik neighbors of the world, the Jalen Waddles of the world. You know, we'll see what happens with Brandon Ayuk. But, like, the guys going in that range, some of the Texans that we'll talk about here in a second, the, the guys that are going in the range that Devontae Adams certainly have more upside, but maybe not as high a floor because he is ultimately still Devontae Adams. Does it matter to you, Connor, who, who gets the quarterback job? In Las Vegas? Yeah, I would like, I would, if I'm drafting Devontae Adams, I want it to be Gardner Minshew. A and I know people probably look at Aiden O'Connell and say, well, he's a second year player, he's a younger player. Maybe there's the higher ceiling. I would want the chaos of Gardner Minshew to help Devontae Adams maybe beef up that yards per target. So, which is, that, which is fair, time. by the way. And a new offense coordinator there in, in Las Vegas. So even though it's year two of O'Connell, they're both right. starting from scratch. And uh, Antonio Pierce said he hopes to make the decision of who his starting quarterback is going to be. Uh, they're playing the Cowboys in a preseason game this weekend. So he's hoping to make the decision after that game. We'll see if he actually does or not. But I, I agree with you. I think fantasy-wise, Minshew's the more interesting play, even though – AOC is a friend of the podcast. We had him on. And I think, I think if you're drafting Jacoby Myers, you prefer AOC. I, that's the problem. There is, there's a, there's a connection there, but um, uh, between AOC and, uh, and Myers, they actually both did our show together. 
uh, when we were in Vegas for the Super Bowl. But uh, I agree with you. I think Minshew's the more interesting fantasy option. Just he adds more rushing upside. And, you know, I agree with you, sort of the chaos of uh, Minshew mania. It'd be more fun. That's for right. sure, too. Matthew, you, you hinted at the Texans wide receiver trio, which can be a little difficult to decipher in fantasy. We know they're all going to matter because Stroud and this passing attack is just simply too good going into year two. But with the addition of Stefan Diggs, the return of your guy Tank Dell, who looked great in his preseason return from injury, what order do you draft these guys and, and how do you draft them? <sighs> I well, the order you drafted them. I mean, I, I I'm not holding fast and tight to this, but like like I here's how I've ranked them. I've got Nico at wide receiver 12. I've got Diggs at wide receiver 19. I've got my guy Tank Dell at wide receiver 25. But I think they're all going to be productive. I think they're all going to be fantasy viable this year. I think what you'll see is is that I think it's going to be when they go two tight when they go two wide receiver sets. It's going to be Collins and Diggs. But I think that just the efficiency of Tank Dell, who, you know, they're going to, they're always going to take deep shots to Tank Dell. And so he doesn't need a ton of volume to be fantasy productive. Again, he had six games last year where he had seven or more targets, he averaged over 23 fantasy points per game. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you saw this. I linked to it in my 100 facts column, which is up now on rotorworld.com. Of course, I'm a company man. Check it out. It's 100% free. But I mentioned this in my 100 facts column. There was an interview that C.J. Stroud did with Micah Parsons. Micah Parsons has a podcast uh, that he does uh, with Bleach Report, which is interesting. Jay, I don't know if you noticed it, but basically Connor left Bleach Report and they replaced him with Micah Parsons. <laughs> it's just not you know, entirely inaccurate. It's a yeah, massive downgrade. It's exactly. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. They're like, how do we? How do we replace Connor Rogers? Well, let's go get you know the best defensive player in the NFL. He's even on the which, draft show. Yeah, he technically <laughs> did kind of partially replace me. I'm just he's saying. He's a way better edge rusher than you as well. He's, he, yeah, he's he is. And, and by the way, from what I understand, again, no disrespect, but I think he has a bigger house than you. <laughs> That's up for debate. Nobody has seen my new house yet. There's probably a good chance, though, he does. I'm I'm, I'm willing to lay good money on that. <laughs> yeah, what are the odds? <laughs> I'm not Hamlin type of price. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, be careful. It's, Burn it's, you it's, once, Jay. At any rate, on this on this show that he did with Micah Parsons, and I linked to it's it's actually great. I, I'll do you know like it's actually fantastic. And so Micah and CJ Stroud they go through this exercise where they're like they Micah drafts a defensive team of current NFL players, and Tank Dell drafts a um, uh, um, uh, drafts a um, uh, an offensive team, and they and they go through what they would do in a play, and it's like it's actually fascinating. They and then both Micah Parsons and CJ Stroud like totally nerd out on sort of football talk and, and strategy and theory. And it's great. But the reason I bring all this up is that CJ Stroud was basically, Hey, pick any wide receiver you want yeah. in the NFL. And I believe it was, uh, I believe it was Jamar chase, um, Devonte Adams and tank Dell. <laughs> like he didn't pick Nico Collins. Now people kind of la like laughed at him and didn't miss the point of how much tank Dell is his guy. Exactly. That's my point. And we talked about, yeah, I mean, I interviewed both Tank Dell and CJ Stroud at the NFLPA rookie premiere uh, uh, last year, uh, over a year ago, and both guys talked about each other. You know, Tank Dell obviously went to college in Houston. Um, and I mean, it's one of the reasons why Tank Dell, I like, kept talking in the preseason last year about, which I thought wound up being one of my better call, one of my, honestly, one of my best calls of the year. I had a lot of calls that worked out last year, but Tank Dell, I think, was, so. you know, yeah, you bet. Damn right. There you go. Yeah. You um, take a lap if, uh, in your head. I might. Don't actually I, maybe I'll get up and do a lap here in my room, in my head. office yeah. at home. Uh, no, all seriousness, though, what we talked about it throughout the preseason. Tank Dell's going to be a thing. And he sure was until he got injured. But it was just they talked about the fact that they spent – they were – whether they were just chilling or they were playing Madden together or they were, like, you know, working out in the offseason. Like, they were just on the same page. They are very close – personal friends in addition to obviously having great on-field chemistry. So I don't know that it, I don't want to say it, it doesn't matter, but I almost feel like it doesn't matter because I think all three guys are going to be productive and there'll be weeks where one is, is more quiet, but I think they're going to go more three wide receiver sets. I think they want to be more balanced than they were last year, but still I think second year in Slovak system, I, I think the sky's the limit for all the Texans wide receivers and Stefan Diggs in a one year prove it deal where he's not going to see double coverage where they've got to deal with Tank Dell taking the top off, where they've got to deal with Nico Collins. Like, I think Diggs, you know, hopefully gets on the same page with CJ Stroud, but I think Diggs still has something left in him because 
first half of last year, he was still Stefan Diggs. He was still an elite wide receiver. I just don't know what happened over the second half of the year. Yeah, I think the way that you would order these guys, um, I think that, so right now, Nico Collins is going as wide receiver 16, Diggs is 22, and Tank Dell is 26. I would say that I would have Nico as the clear number one guy. I just think he's the best wide receiver, the most talented player um, in that core. He's He was second in the NFL in yards per route run last year behind Tyree Kill, um, top three in PFF grade. I just think that he is the best player and he is clearly number one. And then I think Diggs and Dell, I just think that's a coin flip. And at cost, I'd prefer Tank Dell because as much as it was an aberration, the end of Diggs' season, like he is getting older. It just it wasn't great what he showed out there. He just didn't look like the same player. Maybe that was because he was unhappy in Buffalo, but I don't know. He just didn't look right. So uh, I would just, if at cost, I think Dell is the option over Diggs. The Roto World Draft Guide is here for you during the peak of draft se- season. And this year it has added features available exclusively through a new partnership with Matthew Berry's Fantasy Life. Yeah! Get a Fantasy Life Plus subscription and receive the Roto World Draft Guide to help you crush your competition. Use promo code ROTO10 for 10% off and unlock extensive fantasy, DFS, and betting tools now. Go to NBCSports.com slash Fantasy Life to learn more. All right, let's keep our... Yeah, you, should wide... get, you should get this Fantasy Life Plus subscription because we have... Well, I'm waiting for like, my promo we have, code. We have parlay builders. It, it helps with you know any of the DFS pick'em stuff. You know, it would help you avoid guys like Michael Thomas in in, uh, in season long fantasy as well, because you can it customizes that. the ranks for exactly your scoring system. Uh, yeah, that sounds great, Matthew. But uh, Michael Thomas is going to be wide receiver two on the Vikings um, pretty shortly. <laughs> so let's uh, let's not give up on the Michael Thomas train just yet, my friend. He's uh, still got I, something I, left I on the tank. But fantasy Life Plus, it's uh, it's really fantastic, and obviously, of course. It uh, it features the Roto World Draft Guide. It is an unbelievable value. We spent a year developing all the tools in there. They will make you better. I promise you that. And by you, I mean you, Jay Croucher. I mean specifically, specifically you. Specifically, yeah. Looking at you. Yeah. I have a lot of room for improvement. Right I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready for fantasy life. While Jay continues to hope for a revitalized Michael Thomas, if that happens, the world is hoping for a revitalized, healthy Cooper Cup right now. Who? Jay, is he simply, you, you hinted at this a little earlier when we were talking about Marvin Harrison, you were like, I like the player, but I would simply wait many spots to get a comparable wide receiver. Is Cooper Cup one of those guys that's being underdrafted right now? Yeah, so there's, there's two things among wide receivers in fantasy this year that I just don't understand, recognizing that it's a fairly efficient market. Don't understand why Justin Jefferson isn't going higher, and I don't understand why Cooper Cup isn't going higher. And here is the case for Cooper Cup. Here is where he is ranked in fantasy points per game the past three years. First, first, and then 24th last year where he's coming off an array of injuries. And I think that everyone has just kind of baked in that he's definitely not the same guy who was first in 21 and 22 because of those injuries. But for me, I think that he has earned the benefit of the doubt and he showed enough flashes last year. He played 10 full games with Matthew Stafford in the regular season and he scored 20 plus fantasy points four of those times. So he still has upside. He absolutely cooked the Ravens secondary, the best defense in the NFL towards the end of the season. And I think with a full off season uh, of health and all the reporting out of camp, Jeremy Fowler had a really insightful look at the Rams camp where he said that not only is Cooper Cup back physically, but he is the wide receiver one for the Rams over Puka Nakua, that he is being treated as the guy. So I just think that relative to cost, like he's going outside the top 40 in some fantasy drafts. I just don't understand how that can possibly be the case when he's like, it's been talking about like he's 34 years old. The Cooper Cup is nine months older than Tyreek Hill. And Tyreek Hill is dealt with injury issues as well. So like Tyreek Hill is wide receiver one, wide receiver two, and Cooper Cup is wide receiver 18. Like I just think that Cup should be significant, going significantly higher. Uh, his over under for receiving yards um, on DraftKings is 950.5. Like, give me the over on Cooper Cup. Like, he's going for 1K plus at least, I think. Uh, and I think that he's going to be in for a big bounce back year. Because I, all the reporting has been that, you know, he took last year, he took it really rough. The way that he is being talked about as not an elite wide receiver anymore. We know how much he takes care of his body. He's going to do everything to put himself in a position to succeed. So uh, give me all the Cooper Cup shares. I'm 100% with you. 11 games last year, my little Cooper Cup. You know, I love Cooper Cup. But listen, he, he had 11 healthy games last year. And in those 11 healthy games, he had a 27% target share. He had the same number of targets as Puka Nakua. 
in that time frame as well. Uh, those 11 healthy games, he averaged almost 15 fantasy points per game. He had three different games with 25 or more fantasy points. So kind of three three weeks where you know he won you the week single-handedly as well. I have him at 33 overall on my ranks. My ranks, of course, up for free on rotoworld.com. I'm a company man. But I have at 33 overall. And just to give you a sense of like at, on ESPN, he's going at 49th. No, Yahoo, he's good. going at 38. So Yahoo's, you know, Yahoo's a little bit better, but Yahoo defaults is half point PPR. ESPN is full PPR. So I, I honestly, I, I'm baffled by the ESPN ADP of basically barely top 50. He's going 20, basically like 23rd overall on underdog, but that's more best ball. And so where you, you're not worried about the injury because it's like when he has a good game, he's great. So it makes more sense there. Um, but I'm at 33 overall. So I'm much higher than him, uh, you know, in the overall consensus ranks than he is going where like on ESPN or Yahoo. And I just, um, I, I'm with you. Like the only, the anti Cooper cup argument is literally health because to your point, like Tyreek Hill, basically the same age, also a prolific offense. I, I would argue Cooper cup probably has a better quarterback for him. Yep. Like Stafford and cup have more of a connection than, um, than two and Tyreek to an extent. Um, and I think you could argue that, I mean, again, Tyreek's Plays dealing with, with Waddle well. for, for targets. Cooper's right. dealing with Nakua. Like Hill has more established competition for targets. They've also dealt with, again, I'm not comparing Cooper Cup to Tyreek Hill because Tyreek Hill is also a guy that can go for 200 yards any given week. <laughs> like, you know, um, he's unbelievable. But I, I think it's a well spoken point that, like, no one's knocking Tyreek Hill for being over 30 and having injury concerns. And they're just killing Cooper Cup who is not that far removed from being, you know, back-to-back -back seasons of being, you know, one of the elite wide receivers on a point-per-game basis. And so where he's going, you know, at 33 over – I mean, he again, he's going in he's going in the fifth or sixth round on ESPN. He's going the in the fourth to fifth on Yahoo. So, you know, I am as a – I'm as a late third, early fourth. Uh, right. Right big now, fan of Cooper Cup this year. And I, I agree with you. I would rather – I'll just say this. At cost – Give me Cooper Cup over Puka Nakua all day, every day. Yeah, and right now on ESPN, Cooper Cup is going after the following people in drafts. He's going after Devontae Smith, Debo Samuel, DK Metcalf, Stefan Diggs. I'd, I'd just straight up rather Cup than any of those guys, like irrespective of cost. I, I just think that he's going to have a better season. So he's probably the one player that I'm going to end up with the most in drafts, I think. Matthew, another wide receiver in your top 25 overall wide receivers, Michael Pittman, uh, Anthony Richardson back healthy with the team. Pittman's a guy that had a lot of success with Gardner Minshew last year. How do you see the return of Anthony Richardson, a guy that can push the ball down the field, but also likes to run a lot? What do you see his impact on Michael Pittman? Is this one that kind of balances out where it's it's kind of a push? Yeah, I mean, I haven't won receiver 24. So I'm as I have a mid-tier wide receiver three, you know, with some upside, right? But this is a guy that has had two different back-to-back -back seasons with over 140 targets, over 95 receptions as well. Uh 30% target share last year, to your point about like just seeing him. Now, the injury to Josh Downs is, is a little bit um again, it's be a lot of focal point on Michael Pittman, but given the mobility of Anthony Richardson, you know, I know people have high hopes for uh for AD Mitchell. So uh there as well. So I don't know. I just, I think Michael Pittman's just really talented. I, you know I mean? I just, again, he's more of a, I, I feel like on some level, he's kind of a younger version of Devonte Adams and that he's more of a floor play than an upside play. But this is a guy who's had at least five receptions in over 80% of his games. Like it's very rare that Michael Pittman just completely disappears. Like, I feel like you always get something from Michael Pittman, 10 different games last year with at least eight receptions that led all wide receivers in the NFL. Uh, and, you know, you, you figure a little bit more touchdown equity. I mean, you tell me, Connor, about how you feel Richardson will progress as a pastor. I thought that last year, again, we had such a small sample size with Richardson, but I think he was much more polished as a passer in the NFL than we thought coming into the season, again, in a small sample size. Yeah, I thought so, too. I think he's a guy that did, wasn't asked to throw the ball a ton while of that last year at Florida, but showed flashes of being able to make every throw, push the ball down the field. What intrigues me here, you bring up the Downs injury in the meantime, does that open up some slot opportunity, power slot opportunity for Pittman, 
that that could be a comfort place for a guy like Richardson, where downs looked good with both Richardson and Gardner Minshew. So maybe just overall, the slot is a comfort place. Maybe they could play Pittman inside and outside out of the gate for the season. And I think that would get those two going as well. So I see it just canceling out. Pittman was really good last year. You brought up the floor point, Matthew, where he's not a guy that is going to you know finish as a top five wide receiver in fantasy, but you know what you're getting within this offense. I'm a believer in Sykin. Richardson's going to be fine. I know he needs to shake off some rust in the preseason. I wouldn't overreact to that at all. Uh, so overall, Jay, I feel I feel good about this duo. Also another offense where it doesn't feel like there's a ton of mouths to feed through the air, which is good for a quarterback that shouldn't be asked to drop back 40 plus times a game anyway. Yeah, definitely. Not a ton of competition. And I think as well, Michael Pittman is, is probably one of the more quarterback agnostic wide receivers right. in the league just because he has such a low average depth of target. Like he was able to produce with Matt Ryan as his quarterback. He's going to be able to produce with Anthony Richardson. Of There were 80 wide receivers last year who saw at least 50 targets. Michael Pittman ranks 69th in average depth of target. So, and look, it's not like Matt, um, Anthony Richardson can't throw it deep either, but I just think that in Steichen's offense, he's going to get his looks. Uh, the past three years, Pittman in total points among wide receivers has finished 17th, 20th, and 13th. Like he's just rock solid. He's super high floor, not a massive ceiling, particularly with the fact that you would expect the Colts with just on average JT being healthier and Anthony Richardson obviously being in the frame. They're probably going to run the ball more than they did the previous year, the Gardner Minshew show, but still Pittman's going to be the clear wide receiver one there. Guys, a year two wide receiver that could be on the rise, Zay Flowers last year, he breaks 100 targets as a rookie, has 108 targets in Todd Munkin's offense. What's really interesting on this one, Matthew, is that out of those 108 targets, 44 screen plays was tied amongst the most for wide receivers. That's not going to change. It's the same no. offensive coordinator. It's the same kind of player. But when you look at Zay Flowers, is there reason to believe in a breakout, breaking out to what he had last year where he was still under 1,000 yards? Yeah, I believe so. Look, I'm at wide receiver 26, but just like I think he is, there's a wider range of outcomes for Zay Flowers than there is for Michael Pittman, who again, I think is more of a floor play there, like in the middle, you know, as a, as a wide receiver three, but Zay Flowers could be elite. I mean, there, there are moments last year where you were just like, whoa, whoa. Yeah, like that just, he sort of popped off the screen you know, 24% target share for Flowers, which was top 20 among wide receivers as a rookie. Thought that was very impressive. Obviously, Mark Andrews' injury played into that. But still, uh, he had 10 different games last year where he had at least six targets. He averaged 15.6 points per game. So I think Flowers, yes, you've got Andrews back, and, and they want to get Isaiah Likely more, uh, more involved. And so you'll see more two tight end sets. But honestly, like, his competition for targets, like, it's – Rashad Bateman, like, you know, and we keep hearing, like, stop me if you've heard this before. This is going to be Rashad Bateman's breakout year. Like, I I don't know. I thought just from a, from watching the film, Zay Flowers popped to me last year in terms of just his talent and explosiveness. And so I think second year in the system, second year in the league for Zay Flowers, there's an upside there that not a lot of people in this range have uh, where, again, there's, it's going to be a running offense more you know andrews being healthy but uh you know if, if we're talking a year from now that zay flowers was a top 10 fantasy wide receiver this season i don't think that would be shocking no and i, I think a sneaky uh storyline of the offseason that no one's really talked about is like baltimore added nothing at receiver no. like it's the same guys it's bateman and nelson Aguilar. that's who uh who zay flowers is competing with and I think with Flowers, who was a first-round pick, and I think delivered um, last year, he showed everything that you would want him to. Obviously, he had uh, an inauspicious end to his season with the performance in the AFC title game against Kansas City. But for me, the thing with Flowers is that last year, there were four games all season where he put up 20-plus fantasy points, and all four of those games came in his final five uh, weeks of the season. So now that coincided with Mark Andrews going down naturally, but at the same time, like Andrews is about to turn 29 next month and is coming off, um, you know, a pretty severe injury. So there is huge upside in Flowers, and also just with the way that he gets used and just the the screen stuff and the short stuff, I think there's a pretty high PPR floor as well. Looking over at the Steelers wide receiver room here, guys. Obviously, Deontay Johnson off to Carolina. George Pickens last year breaks 100 targets, goes over 1,100 yards, only five touchdowns. Jay, it's a little bit of a weird quarterback situation, both between Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. 
But there's just not a lot there in terms of guys that consume targets from Pickens right now, especially as you know they haven't really added a lot of guys besides the draft. Is there a chance that Pickens can be a true wide receiver one this year in the offense? That The offensive line is going to be a lot better through the draft as well. Or does the quarterback play kind of limit his ceiling? I think on average, the quarterback play for Pickens is going to be better this year than it was last year between Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. I prefer that duo to what they got out of Kenny Pickett and uh, the Mitch Trubisky saga and then Mason Rudolph at the end. I think the issue with Pickens is that he kind of already was the number one guy in the passing game last year. I know Deontay Johnson was there and there's less competition now, but I mean, Pickens was kind of the guy. Um, And I'd throw it back to you, Connor, like in terms of his just route diversity and sophistication. Does he have the skill set to diversify more and go into that next tier? Because last year he finished as wide receiver 29. Yeah, I think he does. I think he's somebody that can capitalize on, you know, the vertical aspect of the offense, obviously the red zone aspect. But if you get him working in the short area with that big body, the long arms, get him on slants and outs, he could do everything. Talon has never, ever been a problem for George Pickens. And I think the more... The ball comes his way, the more locked in and focused he is. That's always been the case. So if he can't do it this year, Matthew, it's simply just not happening. But I would bet on it, you know, happening this year at all years. I'm at 29. I'm at wide receiver 29. You know, I think some of the concerns for me is like a little boomer bust, right? He had under 50 receiving yards in 53% of his games last year, single digits in almost 60% of his games last year. And I just sort of think about Drake London last year. Like my concern is less about Russell Wilson and Justin Fields and more about Arthur Smith and the kind of offense he's going to call. Like we've had a lot of fun at Arthur Smith's expense on this show, but just real talk. Like I get it. He had Desmond Ritter and Tyler Taylor Heineke quarterback last year. And you figure Russell Wilson, Justin Fields is an upgrade over that, but I don't know that it's a massive upgrade over that. And I mean, Drake London, I mean, we think Drake London's a pretty good wide receiver, right? I mean, like, I don't know how you rated them coming out of college, but I think you had Drake London higher than Pickens. Significantly. Yeah. yeah. And they couldn't get the ball to Drake London last year. So I just, I'm worried about, I, I think in Pittsburgh, especially by the way, they're going to have a much better defense, the Steelers are, than the Falcons did last year, where they were in a dome and they got, you know, they were they were in a dome and in the NFC South with, you know, not nearly as good a defense as the TJ Watt-led Steelers playing outdoors in Pittsburgh in the AFC North, right? So now you've got Pickens going against the Ravens twice, the Bengals twice, the Browns twice. Um, they gonna be playing outdoors. I, I think, I actually think Arthur Smith is going to be successful in Pittsburgh because I think of what they want to do and how that team is built is they're going to run the crap out of the ball and play good defense. And they're going to win a lot of games, 17, 14, 20 to 17, you know, like, and which is fine. It's kind of Steeler football and i mean i do think arthur smith is a very good run game coordinator like we we joked about the Bijan robinson stuff which drove us crazy but like he was able to get production out of tyler algier he was able to get production out of cordero patterson like he like i don't think he's a particularly good coach but i do think he knows how to coach a run game and i think that's what they're gonna that's what the offense in pittsburgh's gonna do so i'm concerned about pickens i think is more boomer bust um i i don't I think he's going to be the number one wide receiver for the Steelers. I don't think he's the number one wide receiver for fantasy. I think he's going to be a boom bust wide receiver three this year. Our final wide receiver topic for today, guys, T Higgins, Matthew, somebody who dealt with an injury riddled season last mm-hmm. year. There was a lot of thought he could be on the move this off season, maybe to an offense where he becomes the guy that didn't happen as well. Now we're looking at an ADP that is outside the top 60 in fantasy for T Higgins. While the concerns are all there and we're aware of them, has this simply just gone too far for such a talented player and a talented passing offense? I think so. His ADP on Yahoo, he's going outside the top 60 on ESPN. He's going outside the top 70. And you know, this is, this is a guy who, you know, for three straight seasons has averaged at least 8.5 yards per target. In his healthy games last year, he was still getting a 20% target share. I get it. It was a disappointing year, but now on a one-year deal with Cincinnati and Joe Burrow knows he's going to need it. And like, you know, they lost Tyler Boyd this offseason, right? They they lost Joe Mixon. And so uh, I know we're all excited about Chase Brown and seeing what he can do. And, you know, we'll see if if Jermaine Burton can get onto the field. Andre Oshavis, is that how I pronounce his last name? Oshavis, but you're you're close. He's having a nice camp and he's going to be their slot guy. But really, it's going to be, 
Joe Burrow is back. He's healthy, and it's going to be the Jamar Chase and T. Higgins show, as we saw two years ago. And so I'm at wide receiver 30, as you see there on your screen. But in the overall ranks, I'm at 53 overall. Again, he's going outside the top 60 on Yahoo, outside the top 70 on ESPN. I'm at 53 overall. I do think the hate has gone too far on T. Higgins, who wants to have a big year, and the Bengals need him to have a big year, Jay. Yeah, and the Bengals, they randomly play a last place schedule um, this year, which might be the last time that happens in Joe Burrow's prime. So that's helpful to get three easier matchups. I think with Higgins, I get it in principle. At the same time, like on Yahoo, he's going ahead of Tank Dell, Zay Flowers, Malik Neighbors, Christian Kirk. I'd probably rather all of those guys, like slightly above T. Higgins. I just think because of the upside. where He's going ahead of Malik Neighbors? Is he really? Yeah. Yep, that my seems neighbors crazy is wide receiver 28 on Yahoo right now, um, what I'm looking at. So, uh, and T. Higgins is wide receiver 25. Like, I just wow. think that particularly... Well, neighbors is way too low. Let's just start there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's... Uh, yeah. I think with Zay Flowers and Neighbors in particular, like those guys, I mean, they they will be the wide receiver one in their offenses. Um, and T. Higgins has no scope really to do that unless Jamar Chase um, goes down. So... Well, we've seen this uh, yeah. before. We've seen Higgins and Chase both be like top 12 in a season. Yeah, we have. I just think that with just the ancillary factors, the fact that they play in the AFC North and they have to go up against three really good defenses, the fact that you know they play in cold weather, uh, I think that that deflates value a little bit. Um, and so, look, he can provide value, and I think that his ADP right now is fine um going in that you know late 50s early 60s range um again as well you worry a little bit about and i try not to buy too much into like the motivational stuff around contracts but i mean that all that swirling isn't ideal so i did not think i'm going to end up with t higgins in a lot of drafts but i mean he still has the upside and yeah he can have those massive games alongside chase when defenses overload to chase and it becomes the t higgins show so i think he's fine i think he's relatively high floor but there are guys going in that range that I would prefer, like neighbors and flowers. Yeah, no, I don't I don't disagree with that. Again, I have it wide receiver 30, so it's not like I haven't ranked super high. I haven't ranked around where, but just I haven't ranked higher in the overall. And maybe it's just more about draft philosophy and wanting wide receivers yep. that are more consistent than you know uh some of the running backs. But I think just I think in terms of the overall, he's being somewhat disrespected, not necessarily in the positional ranks. Fantasy football just got better this season. One million dollars better. Creator, join a private Yahoo Fantasy League and enter the one million dollar NBC sweepstakes. Plus, earn extra entries to win when players on your roster score a touchdown during an opening weekend game on NBC or Peacock. Now, the redesigned Yahoo Fantasy app or go to NBCSports.com slash Fantasy Million to learn more. Let's close out today's show, guys, with some very noteworthy Roto World player news. This is a lot of this happened since we started taping. JJ McCarthy has a torn meniscus per Kevin O'Connell. Now, this one's a little tricky here, guys, because if they go in and this is how it goes when they go in and do the surgery, and I'm not a doctor, but I am informed of how this operation goes. If it's a trim, it'll be about four to six weeks. If it's a full repair, it could be about four to six months. So we are looking at two totally different situations for McCarthy, but a guy that picked up a ton of steam during his preseason debut, Matthew, now loses all of that. It will be the Sam Darnold show out of the gate. If you listen to our Justin Jefferson combo at the top, it doesn't feel like that changes much, honestly. It does, and it's disappointing for J.J. McCarthy. I'm going to hope for a trim and not a full tear. Right. Thank you for uh, that insight there. But um, as we await news on how long J.J. McCarthy will miss, to your point, it is going to be Sam Darnold. And look, I, Sam Darnold suddenly is on the is on kind of the sleeper radar. He suddenly becomes two quarterback league, super flex, you know, interesting because it is going to be an offense that's going to be throwing the ball a lot. They're going to be pass first. They're going to be fantasy friendly. Darnold is weirdly more athletic with his legs than I think you'd give credit for. Like I remember that, that year in Carolina where he was scoring rushing touchdowns left and right. They were all like sort of gimme bunnies. But like, my point is, is like, he's not, he's not Lamar Jackson or Kyler Murray, but he's also not Matt Ryan back there. Right. You know what I mean, he's, he's, he's got a little bit of a, you know, I think he can get you, you know, 15, 20 yards rushing and maybe a handful of rushing touchdowns as long as he keeps, he keeps the job here. And again, he's, playing indoors in a dome and gets thrown to Justin Jefferson. So um, tough break for J.J. McCarthy, but at least we have some clarity, at least in the early going, on who the Vikings quarterback will be. Um, 
I, I probably think regardless of whether it's four to six weeks or four to six months, I'm no longer drafting J.J. McCarthy, even in a, in a deep league, even in a two-quarterback league. You know, a dynasty league would be the only – or, you know, or like deeper keeper league is the only place where I'm drafting McCarthy until uh, we know at least what the timeline is. Yeah, with Sam Donald, um, he just turned 27 years old. Feels like he's um, been around in his forever, early, yeah. Early to mid thirties. Um, and the thing with Donald, who I, I don't think is going to, you know, suddenly live up to where he was drafted, but he has played in his career. He's been a starting quarterback under three regimes: the Todd Bowles Jets, the Adam Gase Jets, and the Matt Rule Panthers. That's yeah. about as bad as it gets uh, in terms of offenses, in terms of just overall what's going on um, with the teams, particularly with the Rule and Gase Jets. So. Uh, I think there is still this is by far the best context that he has ever played in. If we if we don't give him Shanahan last year, where you know he came in at the end of the Baltimore game, but outside of that, didn't do yeah. a great deal. So I mean, there's still there is upside for competence from Donald, who the last time that he got a, an extended starting look, he looked okay in Carolina. Yeah. I thought. Yeah, he was a he was a hot fantasy quarterback for a minute there for like that first month. It was like insane. He kept scoring all these rushing touchdowns. Some more uh, noteworthy injury news here, guys. Adam Schefter reported that Lions running back Jameer Gibbs suffered a hamstring strain in practice on Monday. Now, these ones, Matthew, can be a little tricky because you don't with a running back. It's a hamstring. Yes, it's a strain, which is better, obviously, than a tear. But these things can linger. And obviously, they have a proven running back in this committee as well as David Montgomery. This is one you just have to watch going into the start of the season. That's exactly right. You never like a soft tissue inju injury for anyone, but especially a running back, especially a speed running back. Uh, and um, so this is a concern, but let's see how it plays out. But if you told me right now, if you said, hey, Matthew, Jer Jim Gibbs, Jameer Gibbs is going to miss the first two weeks of the season, but then he's going to play the rest of the way, you'd be like, all right, I'll sign up for that. Again, like Jameer Gibbs couldn't get on the field the first couple of weeks of the year last year, and I think most people were very excited about Jameer Gibbs. Um, uh, playing time, I think this will raise up David Montgomery somewhat. One of the points I made in 100 Facts is basically that David Montgomery is being way underdrafted. I actually think both both lines running backs were a little bit. But, um, you know, the one game that Gibbs didn't play, that week five game, Montgomery 21 for 129 total yards and a touchdown. You, you'll see some Craig Reynolds, best friend of our own uh, Penn State Blake. If you remember Penn State Blake from last year, uh, his best friend is Craig Reynolds. So he claimed. So Blake claim we never actually we've never confirmed that with Craig Reynolds like Craig Reynolds never like called in <laughs> Blake doesn't even work here anymore and he's yeah. catching strays it's exactly yeah. yeah screw you Penn State Blake wherever you were at uh, but uh, you know there's whatever Sion Faki which you could talk a little bit about uh, yeah Faki. I know you two way player the combine yeah Sioni Faki two way player played safety uh, Utah played running back thought he was going to be an NFL safety the Lions are. are See now this is going, and the, the going's been pretty good in the early carries he got in the preseason. So Sione Vaki is going to be that deep dynasty waiver ad this week, you will see. So I, I placed a bit on him. Yeah, I like it. I, yeah. I mean, I think you can um I think you can, you know, drop Gibbs, you know, a couple of spots, but ultimately until we get more knowledge that he's if that, you know, on the level of seriousness of this, I think it's just sort of like, okay, you know, kind of let's see, but you know. We still believe in Jameer Gibbs having a, a big year, but it's just it's worth noting. All right. Another one here, guys, as we continue going down this one, this one really hurts. Matthew Tyrone Tracy, one of our Ugh. favorite rookie sleepers, the day three running back pick of the Giants. He was uh, catching a kickoff in practice and I think it was muffed and he went to pick the ball up, went down with an ankle injury, yeah. was carted off. He's going as we have the information right now, he's going to the hospital of special special surgery for imaging on the right ankle no news yet officially but just does not look good in a backfield where things were wide open for tracy to be the guy at some point of this year in this backfield it was and in the preseason game you and i both love tyrone tracy and in the preseason game i thought it was you know uh instructive that you know he got he got you know quote unquote starter carries yeah. Devin Singletary didn't dress. So, you know, Tyrone Tracy was the running back that got the first carries with, to, you know, what whatever level of it, first team was out there. Eric Gray was the star. And obviously now, uh, you know, for however long Tyrone Tracy is going to be out, Eric Gray has an opportunity uh, to, to make good on 
you know, what he did in the last preseason game. Doesn't feel like Devin Singletary is going to be a every down player as we wait to see the severity of the Tracy injury. And to your point, Connor, does not sound good from all the reports and the fact that, you know, he's in an air cast and they, you know, took him for further imaging and testing. You don't go to the hospital with special surgery for a cold. No, you, you sure don't. But it feels like probably the Giants could be in a market. They'll kick the tires on some. There's a bunch of free agent running backs out there that you've heard of that feels like they'll kick the tires on somebody. I don't think they're going to go into the season with, you know, um, just Devin Singletary and Eric Gray, you know, that of that have experience. Yeah, I mean, there's a chance that the lead or most valuable uh, fantasy running back on the Giants hasn't isn't even part of the roster right now. And it looks like it's going to be the Devin Singletary show, which historically not many people have bought tickets to. But, I mean, he's solid and he knows the system and Dayball likes him. So it yep. seems like he's going to be the guy. Yeah, more of an opportunity for, for uh, Devin Singletary for sure. Our final bit of Roto World player news, and and Jay, I'll start with you on this one before we get to, you know, somebody that's going to be very fired up about this. Martavis Bryant making a comeback. He has signed with the Commanders. Is it the how? How many Martavis Bryant references do you think we get when we return to our studio tomorrow? I just don't know how he's made the rundown. Uh, if he was in the Commander, <laughs> I feel like he's not in this sheet that i'm looking yeah, at just, talk, hey jay and also do me a favor check the markets how how oh. much did the commander super bowl odds uh change now that with now that um uh that martavis bryan is wearing the burgundy and gold are we like so are we two it to looks one like it's still, it's to still one? chiefs one it's still chiefs one um and the commander's the second they're the second right. favorite to win that's what i thought I, I, I thought to win the super bowl i thought we might have moved to like minus 130 yeah. minus 140 he, he hasn't caught a ball in the nfl since 2018 which, according to my math, was six years ago. Uh, he is math. now 32 years old. Uh, he'll turn 33 in the season. Um, the like the the other thing too is that the Commanders kind of have wide receivers already. Like there's Terry McLaurin, there's Jahan Dotson, uh, Dimey Brown, who preseason is any indication seems to have a little rapport Look with good. Jaden Daniels. So I don't think there's a great uh, there's a great deal going on here, Matthew. Yeah, I mean, like. I think that the top three wide receivers are going to be Terry McLaurin, John Dotson, Diami Brown, as we talked about yesterday, Diami Brown, you know, uh, playing there. They're not getting rid of Luke McCaffrey, obviously. Um, they just, they really like him. Although, you know, I think he's had a, a bit of a slow camp, but so it's really, it's going to be, it's probably between Jamison Crowder, um, Alameda Zacchaeus, and now Martavis Bryant uh, for, um, for one last spot. Maybe, maybe two of the three make it and one of them goes in the practice squad. It's interesting, you know, I mean, again, Jaden Daniels likes to throw deep. That is part of his profile. Like, he likes to chuck it deep. He's got a big arm. He likes to shake, take shots downfield. And so adding a guy like Martavis Bryant, who does kind of have that speed, maybe that's maybe that's a result of what they're talking with Jaden during practice. Hey, what, I, what do you like to do? What do you, you know, what are you good at? You know, who knows? Uh, Crowder may be done. Um, but I don't think there is, other than obviously making the the commanders the second favorite to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> I don't know that there's a uh, that there's a fantasy impact of uh, of Martavis Bryant, other than the fact that he plays for the team that I root for. Hail the Commanders! Hail victory! All right, fellas, that is it for us. We are back tomorrow in our studio for the first time this summer. We will be back, and we're going to be taking a look at Matthew's top twenty overall players plus our favorite draft spots this season. So we are back on a five-day-a-week schedule. Tomorrow, we are all back sitting side-by-side. Side. Thank you for sticking with us during our remote virtual shows. We'll catch you tomorrow. Peace out! Thanks, guys. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBCSports.com and RotorWorld.com, and I want to thank you so much for watching whatever it is you just watched, or if nothing else, being too lazy to click out of the autoplay after this video started, after whatever it is you actually wanted to watch finished. But now that you're here, I'd like to take a moment here to ask you respectfully, respectfully now, okay, I'm asking you respectfully to subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel. You'll get the latest Roto World fantasy news headlines, all sorts of great shows, including my own Fantasy Football Happy Hour. So go subscribe now. Again, I'm asking respectfully.